Has Netflix really been all that rattled by the negative coverage surrounding season five of The Crown, or is it one gigantic publicity stunt? Hello, everyone, and welcome to Royal News Network. My name is Brittany, and today we are going to be talking about the report from Deadline that basically Netflix has been really, really rattled by the negative coverage surrounding The Crown. And I find this super fascinating because The Crown, really, in many ways, it is kind of Netflix temple show. This is a show that showed the entire world that Netflix could produce fantastic series. It's always been criticized for not being historically accurate all that much in the slightest and taking a lot of liberties. However, I think the tides and the, and the atmosphere have shifted a lot though, especially with the queen's death. And I think that has put Netflix on notice and I think they are rattled. That is my impression. Now this could be one gigantic publicity stunt and I'll explore that in this video. However, I think they're really nervous about if they tarnish Charles, William, who are now the King and Prince of Wales, what does that mean for their future? Will Netflix, if they want to ever get access to a member of the royal family again? I mean, we know they have Harry and Meghan, but apparently because they're so rattled by all this, they're sh shoving Harry and Meghan's show off to 2023. Now, again, I think that's really bad news for them, but I did a whole video kind of breaking down the Netflix situation generally with Harry and Meghan yesterday. So I will link that video down below. But today's video, I'm just going to talk mostly about the crown. And I think how really they're in a tough spot right now. And while I think they're enjoying the coverage, I think they're also freaked out about what the new season holds. But if you guys haven't been here to Royal News Network before, my name is Brittany and I provide compelling commentary on Royals. I cover news and a little bit of gossip there. I also will review television shows and movies, including The Crown at some point. And we will also discuss a bit of history as well. And if you love Royal fashion, so this is jewelry, tiaras, you know, even shoes and, and clothing and all these sorts of things. And the Royal ladies looking absolutely fabulous. I do have Royal Fashion News that I just launched. I will also link that down below. And that has that launch has gone much better than I even expected. So guys, thank you so much. And I am working on a tiara's video, which I'm hoping to get up for tomorrow for Tiara Tuesday, just kind of a 101 on the kind of the different tiaras and some of the terminology I have learned over the years. However, let's get back to the crown. It is really Netflix's magnum opus. It was one of their first big series. It had a huge production budget, one of the most expensive series of television of all time when it first debuted. I mean, it's been surpassed now by Lord of the Rings, The Rings of uh, Power. And although people really, really enjoyed it, and I did start watching a bit of it, but I eventually tuned out because I'm one of those people, I am weird. I have trouble with historical dramas when they're focusing on B when they really should be focusing on A because A is a lot more interesting and I, I really dislike how they have to create in the Hollywood's realm a character, they have to take a historical character and make him more interesting. I feel like they did, they did that in The Great. So this is a television show which I'll also review at some point with Ella sorry, with Elle Fanning, not Ella, Elle Fanning. And she plays Catherine the Great. And basically none of it's true. <laughs> it's like broadly untrue. And it's like, she's Catherine the Great. One of the stories about her is that she had sex with a horse. I don't think that actually happened, but that is the rumor. She was somebody who was unbelievable in history. That's why she was given the name the Great. You know, they only give those names the Great to like the Great. So we have Alexander the Great, Peter the Great. Frederick the Great, I believe it is, in Germany. So it's like, I don't understand why you had to make her more, in how could you not use the actual history of her story to make her interesting rather than just basically taking this character in history and just making up everything about her with like loose associations with the truth. That's fine. And something like Anastasia, the, the animated movie, which I do love, I love that movie. And <laughs> it's, but it's obviously fake. It's like a wonderful retelling, but it's so obviously fake. And it's a kid's show. That's how it should be. You don't really want to show what actually happened to Anastasia. It's pretty brutal. So I understand why they went with this more fantastical version. But when you're coming to actual dramas, I don't think you have to do that that much. You have to condense things. You have to create storylines that make sense. Totally get that. I actually really enjoyed the tutors. I thought they did a really good job and I liked how they did kind of an age progression of the characters. Hated every time they beheaded somebody. Hated it. Hated it. Hated it. Although I will say Catherine Howard's, what she does right before it, 
is so human and I kind of love it because it is, I absolutely believe that would happen completely and totally. I love the authenticity of that moment. If you want to watch it, you can watch it. You can see for yourself what I'm talking about, but I love the authenticity in that moment. With all that said, I don't really like the direction Hollywood is going in terms of the reenactment. Like I said, with the great, the great is too fantastical. Why can't you actually dramatize what really happened or work within that system rather than basically making everything up? We saw a much more based in reality version with the Tudors. I also really liked Versailles because I thought I felt like that was based somewhat in a reality of that court system. In addition, they actually filmed on location in a lot of these places, including Versailles. And there's something to be said for actually being able to film at specific locations because it gives a greater depth to that world and you, you feel it more rather than sets. You feel it. They're walking around these palaces. They're walking around these corridors. But what's interesting about all these series is that these people have been dead for hundreds of years. The crown, that's not the case. And I think this is really starting to come to the forefront. The closer the crown gets to our, our, our timeline, the more controversial it's going to become because it's dealing with people who are not only alive, but actually really do remember those situations. They remember what they said, they remember what they didn't say. And it's starting to become where the dramatization of the crown is running into not only history, but memory, living memory. And that's, I think, problematic for Netflix. So we've seen this in a lot of different situations regarding the crown. I think when the crown first started, you had the opulence, you had the glamour of Queen Elizabeth. And I was intrigued by the idea that they would do it, I believe initially for five seasons, that they've added a six I find a little bit problematic. But they were originally gonna do five seasons and I think they should have stuck to maybe perhaps expanding on Queen Elizabeth's life from the 50s to the 60s or something to that effect, or maybe even the 40s, watching her grow up. Obviously she was born in 1926, but the 40s when she was younger and the war was going on, kind of growing into it that way, I think would have been much better than what they've done. Because what they've done is they've created this conundrum for their self where they haven't asked anybody's permission and they're dramatizing things that never happen and put living people in a very negative light. And I disagree with that because to me, I'm okay with dramatizing things that happen to people if those people can speak into it, if they're still living. And at the time with the queen, again, Winston Churchill had died. By the time the crown came out, a lot of people, when she be, first became Queen Elizabeth had passed away. So I feel like there was some leeway there because the memories aren't as fresh and people I think were genuinely interested in that time. The problem now is a lot of people who are older, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, remember a lot of this happening. I even remember some of this happening. Really, it's mostly Diana's death is what I truly remember because I was pretty young and it actually happened while our, we were doing this trip right before school started. And I particularly remember where I was and that everybody was really devastated and was what a lot of people were talking about. So I do remember, and I have the Beanie Baby somewhere. I can't find it right now because I have a small space. You guys only see this little part. There's chaos beyond this, <laughs> so much chaos. Hopefully one day I will have a room that's dedicated, a dedicated studio room. Right now I don't have that. So I had to work with the space I have and it's not a lot of space right now. Hopefully I'll get another space a little bit, a little bit soon, but right now it is, it is a daily struggle. <laughs> but getting back to the crown, here's what a couple of people have said. The latest season of the crown covers the 1990s, which some believe in is one of the most contentious times within the royal family. I mean, we think it's bad when Megan, with Megan and Harry. No, it was, I think almost to a certain extent worse in the 90s because we all got all these leaks about Charles and Camilla's conversations, Diana and her lover's conversations. We had Fergie sucking guess, some guy's toes, topless. It was, it was a bad year for the queen in 1992 and Windsor partially burned. So it was her Anibus Horbus. It was a terrible year for her. And they're dramatizing all this and they're adding things that absolutely did not happen. And basically everybody who knows anything about this is calling Netflix out on it. So one of the examples kind of, I think in the beginning of the series from what we understand is this 
thing where Charles apparently got very, very mad at the queen and essentially told her that if social services came by, she would be thrown in jail. According to this report, one particularly dodgy example comes via an episode where Morgan invents a conversation in which the then Prince of Wales tells his late mother that if we were an ordinary family and social services came to visit, they would have thrown us into care and you, the queen, into jail. Another set in the early 1990s involves a fictitious exchange in which Charles plots with John Major to oust the queen and install himself on the throne. The former prime minister this weekend dubbed it malicious nonsense. And it gets worse because Prince Philip is also engaged in this season in an affair with a woman who is a very, very dear friend of his and she's Lady Mountbatten. And what's even more cruel about this, which I didn't realize until reading these reports, is that this is done, their affair begins as she's mourning the loss of her five-year-old daughter from cancer. Ugh. That's just skeevy. That's just really skeevy. The program uses the death of her daughter from cancer at the age of five as a jumping off point to show the Duke comforting her while grieving. It just juxtaposes those scenes with the late queen and her husband engaged in frosty conversations and sleeping in separate bedrooms. Supporters of Lady Mountbatten have been left angered and upset that her close relationship with the queen and her husband has been turned into fiction. The scenes between Lady Mountbatten and the Duke, played by John Pierce, are set in 1991, immediately after the the death of her daughter, Leonora. Lady Mountbatten has declined to comment, but an acquaintance familiar with the family said of her portrayal and the choice of actress to play her. This is indeed an ill-judged, unnecessarily unsympathetic and unfortunate decision. I imagine it is, however, carefully considered and very deliberate in that it has done was probably intended in garnering media attention and therefore publicity for this continued work of Republican fiction. The acquaintance said it would be correct to describe the portrayal as inordinately insensitive, adding it is one thing for a script to be drivel, another to be so deliberately cruel. I think maybe they have shot themselves in the foot rather with this, but for the majority it will simply pass them. According to reviewers, the Queen later summons Lady Mountbatten to Windsor Castle, welcoming her into the family. Family. The Queen explains, should people happen to see the Duke of Edinburgh out and about with a beautiful younger companion, it would be an irritation if they felt at liberty to jump to any wrong conclusion. So why don't you come in the car with me to church this Christmas at Sandringham? Nip all that in the bud. In addition, apparently they're dramatizing Diana's interview with Martin Bashir, who we just learned, I believe this year, that Martin basically manipulated Diana into that interview by telling her lies, feeding on her paranoia to get her to agree to this interview. And because of that paranoia, that growing fear of what the monarchy was doing, Diana declined security protection, which would have saved her life in Paris. Diana perhaps would have been alive if not for Martin Bashir and what he told her and what the BBC by extension told her to secure that Panorama interview. So Earl Spencer has also called this out. In the past, he has criticized it for playing fast and loose with history. The worry for me is that people see a program like that and they forget that it is fiction. They assume, especially foreigners, I find Americans that tell me they watch The Crown as if they've taken a history lesson. Well, they haven't. And I think that's a growing concern for not only the monarchy, but basically people who have a vested interest in the crown is that people, especially I would hate to say it, Americans and others actually think the crown is true. They think it's true, but it's not. It's a work of fiction, but they've done it so well that people don't think that. And I think people also, they don't read quite as much and they're not as interested in actually learning about the truth of events. Instead, they want to go and they enjoy Netflix and the crown. And I feel like to a certain extent, Megan somewhat plays into that narrative as well. They're also apparently planning to portray some of Diana's final moments moments. That's been rumored as well. They're going to dramatize the accident that killed her. And I don't, I think we can all agree, regardless of your feeling about the crown or anything that that's just incredibly distasteful, but that's not a surprise. And they're going to show things regarding Charles and Camilla and the affair. Netflix is doing all these things, but I think they're running into something very particular. And I think this is why they're so nervous. Charles is king. The queen is dead. And that changes everything, I think, in a lot of ways, because Charles now has a significant amount of power, a lot more than he did when the crown started. And the crown has pretty much always been rather favorable to Elizabeth. It kind of throws everybody else under the bus, but it's been pretty favorable to Elizabeth. So I think she comes out of it 
fairly well, but the rest of the royal family members, not so much. And it's based on fact, but it's also skewed very much, like somebody said, to a Republican mentality. And you have all this kind of coalescing with the Queen's death. We have Prince Philip's death, Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. We have the changing of status of everyone. And I think Netflix is worried. They're thinking about the future. So Netflix is going through a difficult time right now. They've had to let staff members go. They've lost subscribers. So they're trying to get some of those people back. They did just have a hit with Dahmer, but they want the, the crown to be a hit too. And granted all this negative publicity, it could result in huge numbers for them. However, I'm also wondering if the the Netflix, like they should be, like any good business should be, is trying to look 12, 15, 20 years ahead. They want to establish themselves. They want to keep themselves at the top of their game if they can. They want to make money. I mean, what business doesn't want to make money? But if they're engaging and closely associating too much with the crown, or if the crown damages those relationships with the royals, what happens if they may have enough, they may lose out on opportunities to interview royals, hang out with them on tours. There's a lot of opportunities there potentially that the monarchy might be more open to now than it was when Queen Elizabeth was in power. And if Netflix severely damages that, that hurts their brand because they could have this incredible access. So what if they don't get access, but what if Peacock does? And Peacock does this whole big thing about the monarchy and it's a huge, massive hit. What happens then? So I wonder if Netflix is starting to just get a little worried because Charles has a lot more power now and they could face perhaps litigation over this. I don't think that's a huge possibility, but it's definitely, definitely something that could happen. And I think as well, Netflix is starting to get cold feet over Harry and Meghan. And I feel like especially the stories about the inconsistencies, again, this could all be PR stuff meant to drum up interest in all these different things. But I think also there's a genuine worry that Harry is not being entirely truthful with his history. And that hurts everyone in the end. That hurts Netflix as a business, that hurts Harry and Meghan's brand. And so Netflix has to protect itself. So it'll be interesting to see how this season five comes together, if it's really as bad as people are saying. But again, I come down on the side of, you know what, most of these people are living. Most of these people actually remember these conversations or remember that they never had X conversation. And I feel like as well, it's starting to get more exploitative. They're starting to exploit more of these situations. Now, granted, there have been dramatizations of Diana's life. There have been certain, you know, Lifetime has done dramatizations of the royal love stories. But I think again, we're running into something where you're actually dealing with real people, real feelings, real emotions, and some of the worst years of their lives. The 90s was not a good time for the royal family. And Charles is in a very precarious state. And I also forgot to mention that Netflix is dealing with the fact of, initially when they started, Charles wasn't that popular. Now he's king, he's very popular. So does it help or hurt them to malign him in the crown? I don't know. I'm not sure if they come across that. And I would also say as well, just looking at Hollywood in general, what's kind of going on, cause I actually follow a lot of people kind of analyze pop culture things. Kind of the biggest things recently has been like She-Hulk and House of Dragon and Lord of the Rings, the Ring of Power. I haven't watched any of those to be honest, but I've been fascinated by the breakdown of Hollywood has gone on so woke that they're alienating huge sections of their audience and people hate and despise some of the things they're putting out. And we see this in Rings of Power has gotten, I think they're at 40, in the 30s percent on Rotten Tomatoes, so is She-Hulk, which the, the critics have said are in the 70s or 80s and the rest of the people are like, no, this stinks, this is awful. And I think Netflix is coming to the realization that people, that the reaction of the public, there are fans out there and if you alienate the fans, guess what? They won't tune in and not only that, they will continue to criticize and critique every aspect of your show. Granted, again, that drums up some publicity, but I wonder too if Netflix is looking at its competitors that Amazon wasted basically a billion dollars on a gigantic flop that most people did not like in Rings of Power. Most people, I am not, I'm not a big Tolkien fan. I enjoyed the Lord of the Rings movies, but apparently what a lot of people who are genuine Tolkien people are saying is that it completely tears up the lore, makes 
the timeline's inconsistent, like it covers nothing that it should. And it goes on all these meandering side stories that add nothing to the overall world or plot. So because they have to, everybody feels like they have to fill certain quotas anymore, certain diversity quotas, you have to have women and, and roles of power and all these sorts of things. So Hollywood has done a great job of alienating its audience. Netflix doesn't want to fall into that because if Netflix is smart, Netflix sees an opening going, okay, let's actually listen to the fans, listen to the people and not go down this path that our other people are going down and actually try to create something that a lot of people are invested in. And again, I feel like those who are really invested in Diana might hate it, invested in Charles might hate it. And again, the monarchy has a lot more power than it did because I think Elizabeth, because she was in her 90s, was kind of asleep at the wheel to a certain extent. She was like, well, I'm, I'm queen. I'm not going to be, I'm going to die at some point. You know, we're just letting everything roll. So I think Netflix was like, they, they had this great opportunity to create something because they knew she wouldn't push back. Charles might push back and that's a problem. So guys, let me know what you think of this video. What do you think about The Crown? Do you watch it or do you not watch it? I need to do a review on it because I want to get something done before November 9th when it comes out. Maybe we'll do kind of a live stream kind of a watch together and get thoughts about it. So guys, let me know what you think and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye.